pleasure and an honor to be part of Kitty's program. Uh, as she said, I'm David Kirkpatrick from Techonomy. I'm a tech journalist. Uh, we put on conferences at Techonomy. Um, and and we, we know Flextronics fairly well, with, and it's a company that we really are fascinated by, and I think you'll understand a lot more about why after we have this conversation. But what we're really here to talk about, and which Mike McNamara, who's the CEO of Flextronics, will be helping us try to disentangle, is this whole gigantic development that's called the Internet of Things, which is a sprawling, undefined, uni you know, diver diversely defined, um, but genuinely important set of developments that are already in the process of transforming our lives. I mean, I'm not going to ask how many in the room, but if any of you have a Fitbit or, you know, have any of those other kinds, that's an Internet of Things precursor, so to speak. They are technically part of the Internet of Things. They're connected electronics that um, do stuff because the data gets ca gathered and, and then we make decisions. And that's kind of a simple definition of the Internet of Things. Um, in fact, I wrote down a definition that came out of a session Day before yesterday, there was a, there's a woman here from Intel who is their Internet of Things person. And I have it here, and now I don't find it. But she said, she had an, oh, yeah. The Internet of Things definition that they use at Intel, taking a thing, connecting it to the Internet, gathering data, and creating information out of that data. One might say knowledge, but she said information. Um, so. Mike, first of all, did I say roughly what you would say about the Internet of Things, and why does Flextronics care about it? I actually think it's a pretty good definition. It's very simple, and um, it makes it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, the re you know, why do we care about it? Um, it's, the Internet of Things has the potential of, of changing everything. You know, the way we work, the way we play, the way we live. Um, because so many different devices can be connected, like your, like your Fitbit right there. Which Flextronics made, by the way. Which we do make, by the way, yes. Um, and that's why we're excited about it. So think about it, you know, we might make the Fitbit, but we make a lot of other things. So if you think about the kind of things we're designing today that might be attached into this Internet of Things, we're making things in the helmets, in the eyes, in the eyeglasses, uh, clothing, purses, Fitbits along with the more traditional things that you would think about, things like mobile phones and smartphones and um, you know, connected devices in the home. So we actually make all the hardware products that are actually connecting into the internet and actually capturing the data. And industrial devices and network switches and all which, kinds of things. Which is, right? which is another way, reason we're, we're excited is because we used to build you know, a lot of electrical mechanical devices. Now all of a sudden there's a huge digitization of all those devices. And whether it's a wash machine or whether it's any um, piece of equipment that's on your manufacturing floor, all these things are now connected. And, and as they get connected, you have a convergence of technologies. That wash machine now has an interconnect connected device that can talk to your smartphone and tell you that the clothes are now dry or you can connect you can talk you know you can talk to it and set timing and change things and you you now have a converged device which is now your wash machine which has hardware that now connects it into the internet in order to capture the data and actually have you um, you know live manage that device so so we get to make all those things so you know the guy that's doing the wash machines he's not very good at doing you know uh, well, wait step back so you're starting to define Flextronics, but I think you've sort of gotten yeah. into it through the IoT more than the audience may understand. Talk a little bit about what Flextronics does, what its heritage is, and what it's doing now. Right. Yeah, so what Flextronics does is, we're, think of us as a, a big end-to-end -end supply chain company where we'll help companies all the way from the design portion of their, the, the, how they were designing a product from the very beginning all the way to scaling that product in multiple geographies. So we have 200,000 people around the world, so we have these huge manufacturing operations, and when Xerox needs to build a Xerox machines, we actually build all the Xerox machines in the last 14 years. Really? Um, I didn't know. We that. build the Fitbit. Um, we build lots of things for Whirlpool wa wash, uh, you know, So Whirlpool Xerox has machines. no manufacturing of its own? They, they, they do all they, that with you? They, they do DocuTex. Uh, they have a small, small factory of DocuTex, um, the great big long things that you'd see in like a FedEx. 
Um, but we do everything else. So we've been, so if anybody has a Xerox machine in, in any of your, your offices, um, we've built every one since 2001. So people don't know about us, but we have huge access to what are the supply chains, what are the trends in the world, what are the technologies that are coming in, and, and that's how it you know, connects into the internet. Now all of a sudden that washing machine needs to get connected. Well, who, who builds more connected devices than just about anybody in the world? Well, it might be Flex, because we're building the Fitbit, and we connected the washing machine, and we're doing the Chromecast for, for Google, and you can just go on down the road. And as more and more of these devices connect into the internet in order to get that data, in order to get that information, um, a lot of times they're coming to a company like Flextronics who has the know-how who we, who we can help them move into the digital world. So you, you, if I understand the company's history, you kind of started with a lot of outsourced manufacturing in Asia, uh, which was getting nicely going, and then the, inter the PC industry came along, and the company just blossomed along with it, making a lot of connected things for the PC, PCs themselves, early laptops, later laptops, then cell phones, and, mm -hmm. and, and on and on, and as the electronics industry, you know, triumphed and changed all of our lives, you just grew and grew and grew. So now, mm -hmm. essentially to interpret what you just said as increasingly, and this is what is really weird, but the big proponents of the Internet of Things would tell you, and I would probably agree, that increasingly, almost literally everything that is made will be connected, or will be capable of being connected. And whether we want that or not is another discussion, but that's certainly the direction people making things believe it should go, because everybody wants more added value out of however generic a product they might have. And if it has software and connectivity in it, they can charge more and all kinds of things. So that means basically you are now in the position where you could make almost anything, not just PCs and cell phones and right. network switches. And stuff. Yeah, we started, um, if I go back, you know, I've been with the company since it was $100 million in revenue, and today we're $26 billion. So I've been and seen the whole transition. And it really started as a company of doing labor arbitrage. Right. So just think about low cost labor. And we were the first to go into, into a place like China and Mexico, and, and, but also have big operations in the United States and Western Europe. So we, we needed to have, in order to service our customers, we need operations in every different country. We have like 30 different countries. It moved from labor arbitrage, because the labor arbitrage has largely played its way out. You know, if you build in Well, Mexico, that could be a whole subject for an idea session, one, yeah. actually. If there's no more labor arbitrage, that's a big change. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's very little. People that need to build in Mexico to hit a cost structure or to be able to meet their consumer demand profiles, whatever it is, have already moved there. And people who have moved to China to take advantage of lower labor costs have already moved there on average. And that was a large part of what we did for the first 10, 10 15 years of our, of our uh, existence. If we think about it now, you have all these software companies coming in to play. Um, you know, we talked about Chromecast earlier. Yeah. So you've got a hardware device that's made by Google. Now, Google you don't think of as being a hardware company, but they're rapidly moving into many, many different hardware products. Does anyone but me have a Chromecast in this room? Yeah, okay, a lot of yeah. people. See, Chromecast, they're pretty cool, right? Does anyone who have one hate it? I find it quite quite useful. That's but it, but $30 it's, uh, and but Google if you think sells it, it so that they it, can keep me on you know, Google more often. Yeah, yeah they, want you, they want you there all the time. But if you think about what's the purpose of that device for Google, it's not to make, you know, I think they sell them for $39. It's not yeah. to make the margin on the $39. It's an access point, real time, in the environment that is, you know, they want to sell, you know, their, their business model is software and content. But very often you need a hardware device in order to access the software and content. So you need a system, hardware, software, content as a system. And more and more, what we're doing for companies is not just labor arbitrage, but a company like Google might come to us and say, hey, can you design and build this thing and scale it around the world? And I need to get into these distribution channels, and can you send it into all these distribution channels? Because they want to focus on monetizing the eyeballs on that bigger screen for more hours. That's where they want to focus their time. So very often, we're the enabling um, force, if you will, that actually can take a product from sketch and take it all the way into huge scale operations. Like you, you can imagine the Chromecast, you saw how many hands went up just now. There's a lot of them out there. So you have to build this in huge volumes. We, we have thousands and thousands of people working to build the Chromecast right now. 
So as it creates a huge opportunity, so our business has had to transition. We still have these huge operations around the world and this huge capability because we've got this factory footprint of 200,000 people. But at the same time, the role in, that we have to play is not only just to manufacture it, but we have to design it. We have to help integrate these multiple technologies. You know, getting the wireless technology into the washing machine. It's, yeah, it's now right. more technologies, more complicated, more complexity. And it's in an environment, interesting enough, that it's happening in an environment where there's more and more international competition, there's faster and faster product life cycles, and there's more and more choice by the consumer, yeah. all creating a more complex environment. Well, one of the things I want to do is go through what kind of things we're going to feel and see in our homes and in our workplaces and factories and in society because of the Internet of Things. But before we get to that, one of the things you were saying as we were talking earlier that I thought was quite interesting was this idea that you feel that software companies in general, particularly consumer-oriented software companies, are more and more going to go into hardware. Mm -hmm. Explain why you think that's more or less inevitable and, and how that will play out. Because the amount of, you, you can, so this whole internet of things, um, you know, if I, if I was to take a shot at that definition, I'd take it one step further. <clears throat> um, because what, what we think about it, it's, it's, this is like the age of intelligence. This is, it's the intelligence of things that's creating the opportunity and, um, and the businesses uh, right now. So the internet's been around for 30 years, as you guys all know, um, and it's provided a backbone of communications for many, many years for many, many different kind of things. What's happening now is the end devices themselves are now connected, and those end devices are capturing data. They're, they're taking environmental data, they're responding to the environmental data. Very often they're real-time reacting to the environmental data without anybody helping. So it's what we call the intelligence of things. So the, the new data is endpoints in the field that are actually adapting to environmental and marketplace conditions on a real-time basis and then sending data back through the internet into where devices, uh, into where you can create knowledge out of it. That could be about our health, traffic on a highway, air pollution. All uh, those things. So you got guys counts. like, you know, you talked about, um, some people are talking about everything will be connected. You know, Samsung came out and said in 2000, by 2018, we will not have anything that doesn't connect. And as you know, they do everything from wash machines to they're in cars, they're in, in all kinds of places. Bosch is another company. Bosch said that, yeah, I was going to mention that. Um, who, who said the same Bosch thing? Bosch makes a lot of home appliances, and they're not making any that aren't connected. Yeah, and it's heavy into cars and things like that. So the answer is, yeah, cars, yes, appliances, yes, the connected home, all these kind of things, because there's actual real value being created by capturing this data in the field. And what's happening simultaneously that's creating this opportunity is that you've got this infrastructure of the cloud, which is unbelievably low cost, and as a result of being such low cost in terms of being able to analyze data and capture data, it's creating new business models. You've got the smartphone. You know, think about Uber. It comes along and all of a sudden it disrupts an industry. Well, the reason it disrupted an industry, one reason is because you had a smartphone. Everybody had a smartphone in their pocket. And the cost of putting that data into a cloud was unbelievably low cost. So it actually enabled a new business model. They didn't have to figure out how to get a device to order, you know, a taxi or to an Uber into everybody's hand. It was already a pre-existing infrastructure. And you have other pre... <coughs> so some of these very, very powerful... Um, uh, backbone infrastructure things are now in existence. So now you start connecting these end products that are very, very low cost to create um, in these interconnecting devices to actually be able to capture data, and uh, it's changed the world. And that's why we think how the opportunity is being created, it's the intelligence of the end device, in which we call the intelligence of things, that's creating the business opportunity for companies like Flextronics, and it's actually what's enabling new and disruptive business models. So going back to the Chromecast, that would be an example of exactly what you're talking about? So, so companies say, think about what Apple did in 2007 when they came out with their smartphone. They, it wasn't just the smartphone, but all of a sudden apps were invented. And it was the hardware, the software, and the content. It was integrating the the music into the device. It was a system. What won then was a system. You think about the, the previous hottest selling phone. It was Motorola Razr. You guys remember the Razr? Anybody have that Razr? Really cool device. No one has any idea what software ran on it, and nobody really cared much. But everybody went out and bought it because it was the coolest, slickest hardware device. And that's how we were competing <coughs> 10 years ago, was around hardware. Today, you have to have a system to really create the optimized consumer experience and Chromecast is a good example, hardware that accesses into software and content and creates 
recurring revenue streams, not just a hardware so, sale. I mean, and I want to get to Nest, which is Google's other big hardware play, much bigger hardware play, but before we do that, I mean, are you basically, and Nest is a case in point of what I'm about to mention, are you basically saying that you think that more and more companies are essentially trying to replicate Apple's business model, which has always been to sell software embedded in hardware that they charge a huge margin for and they give all this very glitzy industrial design to, but it's basically a software business monetized by super high margins on hardware. I mean, do you think that's, because there are the most valuable company in the world, the most successful business that's ever existed in some ways, is that really where everybody now wants to go? You know, I don't, I don't think so. I, I actually think about what are the underlying reasons for success of Apple. And I think that's what people are trying to get to. Because at the end of the day, you have to provide a consumer experience that really creates value in order to go sell your product. So you kind of got to start with the end demand and the consumer. What Apple has done is put together a brilliant software, hardware, content play and wrapped it into a package that works seamlessly together. And that's, so, so their success to me was built around making the customer unbelievably, solving a customer's problems of a super easy to use, very functional thing that actually changed the way they lived. And as a result, they had huge monetization out of it. I think today, companies need to think about how do, how do I optimize the consumer experience? I think it's hard to do it unless you can get hardware, software, content all working together. So the integration really matters, whether you do it all your, but you know, interestingly, Google bought and sold Motorola, they thought they were gonna do that, but they did buy Nest, and let's talk about Nest, because um, it started by a guy who came out of Apple, Tony Fidel, mm -hmm. and he thinks he's be, he building the next Apple, but it's now owned by Google, and it's a hardware company, and it's based on software inside smoke detectors and cameras uh, and thermostats, and soon to be other stuff. How does that exemplify what you're, what you're talking about? Well, look, I think the, the purchase price in that one, I think was like 3.2 billion. Yeah. And there was like 200 million in revenue, hardware revenue or so. Yeah. I, I don't know so exactly the nights, but just yeah. rough, rough cut. There's no way the hardware sales and the profit margin on the hardware can actually justify a purchase price like that. So, um, so maybe they just got lucky on the purchase price. I don't know, probably not. But, but really it's, um, you know, I think the hope was that there's data capture points so that you can have a hardware software content play yeah. in, in there as well. And if you think about going into the home and connecting the home and you think about the access points that now Google has, you have, you know, you have the HVAC, but you also have smoke alarms. What happens with smoke alarms? I know I use Nest in my home, and I think I have six smoke alarms in my house. So now you've got six access points into the house to really know what's going on. Um, and I think there's, so I think over time, there'll be different ways to monetize the invested infrastructure in the home of the Nest product that Google will look to do. And it's just, and it's actually in many cases what we want. Because we actually want the experience of being able to, Talk to that nest, you know, when we're leaving. Hey, I forgot to turn off the air conditioning before I left Aspen here. I just go to my phone and I go turn it off. So we actually want the interconnectedness. We want the inter interaction because it actually improves and it solves a problem. It solves a problem, a consumer problem. And if it solves a consumer problem, it has value to us, we'll probably adopt it. But you're also, I think, in what you said, somewhat implying that the information that may go back to Google from those smoke detectors could be about more than smoke and fire. You know, it could be. Um, I don't really know. That's a good question for Tony Fidel and team. Which he would but... definitely not answer. <laughs> well, I'm not going to answer it for him. You, you could probably answer. But well, I you know, don't make that. I know so you can three... say anything you want about that one, I right? know it, uh, it, it's true. Um, but I know it, you know, at, at the, the purchase price and, and the access points you have in home and, and just seeing, you know, one of the benefits we have at Flex is we get to see probably more new products coming into the marketplace than any company in the world, literally. Um, and the reason is, is we have we have 12 different businesses that we have over a billion dollars of revenue. So whether it's appliances or smartphones or computers or network, network infrastructure, or telecom infrastructure or wearables, auto, um, auto, uh, medical, um, all these things are billion dollar business for us. And we tend to do the latest products because the latest products are the ones that happen to be higher, more digital content and 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 more converged technologies. So we get to, so we, we kind of get the power of insight. You know, we got to get the, be able to see the supply chain innovations as well as the product innovations that are coming into the marketplace. And knowing what a fierce um, battle there's going to be for who controls the home and who controls all those access points in the home, 
it's, it's, it's a lot of different companies going at it. Um, so when I think about, you know, what's Google going to do with Nest over time, to me it provides a great infrastructure to get into the home. Um, you know, it's a very Apple-esque, Apple-type product, you know, per Tony Fidel and his experience, which is, you know, it's good looking, it's functional, it's easy to use the software, it integrates well, it's, um, but you know, I think any business model, these, the hardware device sale doesn't stop. When the consumer buys a hardware, it's a, re, it's a recurring revenue stream that's really creating the value in the business models today and almost all customers, customers are gonna wanna monetize the hardware sale but the hardware sale is the access point into the software and the content and the data where you can actually build recurring revenue streams out of it. So basically what you're saying is that thing that is often said about Google and Facebook that um, when you get something for free, you're the product. <laughs> that means, because they're selling ads, to getting money by selling ads that are targeted at you. Mm -hmm. You're basically saying the same thing is increasingly gonna become true about hardware. That when you, you're, but we're gonna have to pay for the hardware for God's sakes and then still be the product, in effect. And, and, and we should talk about Amazon Echo because how many people here have an Amazon Echo which just really went on general sale last week but has been around, he and I both have one. Does everybody know what that is? It's like Siri in your living room. It's a device that sits on your living room or kitchen counter and you say, Alexa, what time is it? Or Alexa, what's the weather in Aspen today? And it'll say, today the weather in Aspen is 82 <laughs> degrees going up to 90 and it'll be cloudy and blah. Or, it's, or I, my, my daughter, the first day we got it, she said, Alexa, who is Rachel Dolezal? And it said, Rachel Dolezal is a white woman who lives in blah, 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 and who was blah, blah. It did the whole thing. And it's not, it doesn't answer a lot of questions. In fact, the New York Times reviewed it last week and said it's not good enough at answering a lot of questions, but it will get better. It's, everything is connected to the cloud, and as soon as you say the word Alexa, whatever it hears is going up to Amazon servers. And we were talking about the fact, we both have them. And it is turned on all the time. You're supposed to say Alexa in order to invoke it, but who knows? It does listen to everything that's happening in the room, and it's connected to Amazon's cloud at all times. And this is the world we're going into with the Internet of Things. And so that is a case where, in, in, in Am you don't make that one, right? We make a good part of it. You do. Oh, but you're still talking. You're still willing to talk freely about it. Very good for you. <laughs> um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, talk, to, talk, talk a little more about that, because obviously the privacy and security of this whole universe is a key part of what we have to talk about here today. Yeah. Yeah, I think the... Uh the consumer has to make a choice. The Echo is a great example because you don't have to walk up to it and talk it. It's, it's got some technology where you can have it on the other side of the room um, and it can hear you. So the idea is you're just walking around going, hey, you know, so you can hear you all, all around the room. It's not like you walk up to your, your smartphone and like talk to it. So it's, it's an interesting product. And, um, but you know, at the end of the day, it could be very easy. You can go tell Alexa to go order some detergent for you. Um, you tell her to, you know, turn on the music that you want to listen to. So there's value created for the consumer, potentially, in terms of how you use it, in that it's just easy. You get up in the morning, you walk over to brush your teeth, you say, what's the weather in Aspen, because you know you're going there, and you just carry on brushing your teeth, it hears you across the room and tells you the answer. It creates value for the customer, and for the consumer. And I think as long as you're solving these consumer problems, the consumer then has to figure out you know, when's too much data, um, when, when, when is too much data is too much? Okay, but, but <laughs> let me go straight to the question that I was asking you out on the lawn before. I mean, there's all these extraordinary claims for what the Internet of Things is going to bring to us as, you know, we get like 50 Fitbits all over our bodies monitoring everything about us and all over our house and all over our office and on the street and, you know, in the government and all that. And yet, aren't people... You know, people are already getting, I mean, I wrote a book about Facebook, and one of the things that's happened dramatically since my book came out five years ago is that people are way more suspicious of Facebook because they don't really know what it knows about them, and they don't really know why they know all that and what they're going to do with it and what the commercial value is and how come I don't get more of that value. And there's a lot of squeamishness about privacy around Internet products generally. And it seems to me that if we're going to have a smart home where not only are we watched every time we're on our iPhone or our computer, we're going to be watched walking around our living room. People are going to be very uncomfortable about that. And why will that not happen? Well, I think, um, 
I think it is similar to Facebook, uh, quite frankly, David. It's, it's you can put as much data into Facebook as you want. So you can have as wide open a digital profile about your life and your likes and dislikes and, and everything else, or you can have it restricted. And the consumer ends up deciding if he's getting value out of that openness with the digital content or, or not. Um, we're going to have choice as consumers. And the choice will be, I can have an echo that's helping me get through the day. And, but that echo is going to know I'm going to Aspen later today. And that data is now public, not public, but it's... Uh, it's, it's Amazon's. It's Amazon's. And how they decide to monetize it, we actually don't know. But I suspect, you know, that Starbucks and Amazon might be sending me a 50 cents off coupon before I even leave for my trip. So this could create value for some consumers, and we have to decide if we want to adopt it. Um, alternatively, it could be too much. Um, a lot of the new security systems, um, a lot of you guys have Dropcam, which was a very... You have Dropcam? No, I have a, oh yeah, Dropcam, which was bought by Nest, right? Wasn't yeah. It? yeah, 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 another access point into the house at three, four access points. Um, but, you know, the products now are even getting more sophisticated where they're recognizing who's in the house, not just someone's in the house or taking a picture, but if it's the, a certain profile of person, it gets to recognize the profile of the person and says, it's okay, it's in your house, maybe it's the cleaning lady or something. Um, alternatively, um, or knows the way that your children move and things like that. And if it doesn't recognize a profile, it'll send you an alert. So they're getting increasingly more sophisticated in terms of what they see. Yeah. And I think, you know, consumers are just kind of have to decide what, how much data is too much, what data that they want, what data do they not want. And I think over time, there has to be more opportunity for the consumer to know how their data is being used. Okay, but who's going who's to give them that opportunity? Because... You know, it's amazing to me, and, and frankly, I'm a huge admirer of Facebook. I think Zuckerberg is one of the great geniuses of, of, of humanity's history. On the other hand, I think they have really blundered in not giving people enough information about what they're doing with their information and giving the consumers more transparent choices about how to use their data and you know how to disclose or not disclose. It's very complicated. It seems to me it's going to be super complicated in the Internet of Things mm -hmm. for any one entity or even multiple entities to disclose enough to the consumer honestly that would really give them the opportunity to make the intelligent choice. Right. Yeah, I think that's one of the challenges today. I think technology is probably way ahead of regulation and way ahead of the information that's provided um, out of these companies. And you don't actually know what data is being used, how it's being used, how it's being resold. Um, and I think over the time, and so it's going to be a huge issue. I, I mean, privacy is already starting to be a huge issue, um, not just the security portion of it, but, but um, you know, who has your data and how are they allowed to use it? You know, you talked about Fitbit and having all these devices all over your body. Well, I kind of like having some devices on my body monitoring things because, you know, you think about it, you got your body's system, and we spend very little time monitoring it. You know, we spend a lot of time monitoring the, the uh, you know, the heat, the heat and the cold in our house, but we don't spend a lot, you know, we don't check our, our pulse rate very often. We don't check our, our um, uh, blood glucose meters very often, our blood glucose, uh, you know, very often. We don't check our, um, you know, all the vital statistics. You go into the doctor's office and he takes the, the vital statistics and makes a conclusion based on one data point. I mean, it's absurd. And you can actually put, have this data now come and available to you, and you can put it into the internet, and you could actually compare your well, system with Well, Apple's doing with that others. with the Apple Watch and their whole infrastructure they're building. It's, yeah. it's all kinds of data that's going in, and you might be able to use that data to actually be predictive about your own body, that yeah. there is a set of characteristics that you have now seen. It's gone up to the cloud. It's been analyzed by you know, Google servers or Apple servers, and it's, it's basically said you have the same characteristics of these 12 other individuals with a similar body type and weight and all that kind of stuff, and therefore you're at risk of this. So you could actually, we may be getting very valuable data on the most important system there is in the world, which is your body, but at the same time, that means your data's out there. Yeah. And I think, I think technology might be ahead of regulation. Um, I think technology is <laughs> certainly ahead of consumer awareness. And I think over time, we're going to have to address those issues. I'm going to sneeze. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, I am. Sorry. Um, so you guys make see more products than anybody. You just said that. Um, and you're building more and more stuff in more and more diverse ways. Meanwhile, 
what we've just sort of set up here is, if you, you know, the Apple Watch is the most prominent product that's out there that wants to do what you just said to monitor our bodies. You've just said that Dropcam, which is now owned by Nest, owned by Google, is basically watching us in our house and knows who's in the room at all times, and that Amazon Echo is listening to us at all times. So you have Amazon, Apple, and Google basically knowing more or less stuff about us at all times. So who could flex or could, who is gonna build the system that sort of ties it together and says, here's how it's all connected, here's what you have agreed to participate in, here is the set of switches that you can turn on and off various functionality so that you aren't being watched in the bathroom or whatever. Could you guys play a role in that? I mean, you have this, one of the things you have admirably not talked about is this wonderful line that you have from sketch to scale that you, you know, mm -hmm. somebody can bring you guys a napkin with an mm -hmm. idea for a product and then you can have 10 million coming off an assembly line in six mm -hmm. months. So if you have that capability, you have a lot of influence on this world that's emerging. Mm -hmm. So could you help with making it less scary? You know, we can, we enable it. And we, you know, through our sketch to scale system, we can go make these things happen. Now, someone's out there talking to the consumer. What's unique about Flextronics, we're not talking to the consumer. We're talking to all the hardware vendors, all, and they're talking to the consumer. So we are enabling the hardware vendors, bring the solution that the consumer wants into the marketplace. And we do this from sketch to scale. And, and just similar to, you know, like an, like an Apple phone, we've, we've, we probably build like, eight different, we probably build watches for like eight different companies with all kinds of different functionality and some we designed completely from a napkin. Mm. So, so we do that, but we're not defining the standard. And, and I think it's a, it's a great question because who wants to go control the home? Obviously Google does, <laughs> so they've, they've made their play. Um, but, but who's gonna control the home? Google, Apple, Cisco? Well, Amazon Echo know, is PG clearly a, a sign that they wanna play that in that game. The gas and electric companies want to get in and get your information. The cable companies. I mean, there's a lot of companies. Samsung bought that are going smart. In. What? What is it? Little. Little. What is it called? That smartphone. Smart. Bought? Smart bits. Smart, smart. Smart things. Smart things. Yeah. Smart things, which is a company that does an entire home ecosystem of intelligence that turns on your lights and opens your garage and your, locks your door. So Samsung's definitely got to play. Some guys are building hubs for the home to control this information, but they might have multiple uh, radios in them. Which, which just means you can hook up to Google, you can hook up to iOS, you can hook up to any a variety of different standards. So I think over time, we'll see more and more standards evolve um, so that people can continue to deliver the solution efficiently. Um, the more efficiently you deliver the solution, the, um, the more simple the user interface, the more consumer value it creates, and then it'll create newer and better business models. But I think it's probably premature to say, you know, there's gonna be one guy that's gonna gonna okay. own it, because everybody's gonna be after it, and, and, and you also have the big chip guys that are gonna go after it. You know, you Qualcomm and Intel. Well, I just quoted, Intel's person here was talking about Internet of Things. She is the yeah. Internet of Things person at Intel, so they're very into it. Yeah, so you got a lot of different access points into solving the problem, but over time we'll get more standards, we'll get more uh, consistency, but you know, maybe the consumer having choice is a good thing, that there's just not one okay, way Okay, and it. I really wanna hear and you from- you do have the Internet connecting okay. everything. I, I, I want to hear from you, but I want to just make one observation before we go to the audience. And we haven't really talked about the industrial Internet of Things, which is what GE and Cisco are, you know, really, you know, uh, rhapsodizing uh, really to an extreme degree about. And maybe what you're implying is that the Internet of Things is going to happen in an industrial context first, where these privacy issues are not as huge. Because when I'm listening to you at the macro level, and I'm thinking about the massive claims that we hear these companies making about the future of the Internet of Things, and yet you realize it's just starting and the awareness of all these privacy issues has not settled in on the public at all yet. That when that does settle in, this potential panacea of improving the world and our homes with this might slow down quite a bit. So anyway, that's my observation, but what were you gonna say? Oh, wait for the mic. And identify yourself too, please. Uh, I'm Michael Gildenhorn from Washington, D.C. So I have a question about standards. I'm aware of Z-Wave uh, and so on. Are there, is there a standard? Because all these things will have to talk to each other at some time right. uh, in order to have an even greater ecosystem. 
so is there any particular standard that seems to be gaining traction and are there, from an investment point of view, are there any companies that are uh, prominent in that, uh, that standard? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a, you know, probably a good question, probably a better person, better question for our Intel uh, person who's not here, of course. But, um, you know, right now what we're seeing is a variety of different standards that could possibly happen. Um, you go to Las, you know, I went to Las Vegas at the, the Consumer Electronics Show in January and there's all kinds of solutions out there. And, you know, right now um, we're just responding by being able, like we have, we have one home hub that we built that we helped design with our customer. It has six radios in it. So it talks to everything. Um, so it, 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 and this is the end customer that's trying to figure it out. So he's the guy that's making his bet as to what I mean, the six different are. radios to talk to six within one box. Six different types of other devices of frequencies. Yeah. yeah. So six different standards. So over time, yeah. you'll get you'll get more and more you'll get more and more standardization. But I, I don't I'm I'm not sure I'm in a position to say which one I think will work or not work. But um, it just naturally evolves, and these standard bodies start to create things. Qualcomm's trying to drive, um, you know, as an example, trying to drive a body, and they're trying to adopt guys like Samsung and others to get into their system. So um, I think it'll work its way out, and it'll evolve over time. And in the meantime. The consumer suffers a little efficiency because you know you may not need six radios in your home. You may only need two today, and maybe it would be really nice if there was one. But also, there's the operating system question, which is closely related to standards. And I think you're going to see Microsoft, Google, Apple, and Amazon, and possibly Facebook, all five of them, try to play a major role in being the standard operating methodology for all this stuff. And I think you've already seen Google by buying Nest. Make it very clear. Samsung buying, you know, little whatever the smart things. That 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 is probably something if they were good enough, that they would try to do too. So and I would it's also, a wide it's a wild west right now because all the companies think this is basically the next gigantic business for them. But who else? And don't and don't okay, assume. Get the mic over here. And just and and don't assume this is just a U.S. solution. No. So you've also got huge markets right here. outside of the United States. And you've got guys like Alibaba and Baidu and Tencent yeah, yeah. and, and you, you know, them. show me. And these guys are all going to fight to be the standard in Asia and then yeah. expand that not only in China, but also into Africa and other places. So it'll be hard for them to go directly into the U.S. But don't underestimate the power of the, the innovation that's occurring today in non-U.S. For anybody who doesn't know, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu and Xiaomi are basically the four most important Internet tech companies in China. Um, so here, Stuart Gaylor from Houston. Um, are you building any virtual reality devices, and where do you see that industry going? Um, well, and is a, it part of the Internet of Things? That's a great question. Absolutely. First of all, it I is. think any product coming out today is going to be hooked up to the Internet of Things. They are going to be intelligent end devices, and it's going to powerfully change the way we live, work, and play. And that's why I think it's almost so powerful. It's we we've just kind of renamed it you know, the intelligence of things, because it's the end devices that are connected that are, that are the interesting change. Um, so virtual reality. So what I can tell you is um, we're building multiple devices today um, with very interesting possibilities, everything from product design to actually look at, um, you know, a product itself and analyze it real time with multiple members in other cities potentially. Um, obviously, a huge impact with gaming applications, a um, lot of implications in terms of that you can get into in medical and others. So I think the possibilities are kind of endless. Um, and the only thing I can say is, if I look at the valuations of some of these companies, you know, there's some companies that are raising, you know, that, that have raised $500 million, and I don't think they have any revenue yet. Magic Leap. If I'm not going to say I might that mention was, their name. But <laughs> yes. Which is primarily. I'm not saying it is or it isn't. Google was, Leap, I think but Google is said to be their biggest. <laughs> that was investor. very perceptive, David. Thank well, they, they're not that many companies that, that are private that. that have raised five hundred million dollars. So I think about that, and I think about the Oculus. That's a virtual reality company. Yeah, that's then, actually an augmented reality company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doing very different things. And then you also have the Oculus that was acquired by Facebook for maybe two billion with hardly any revenue, right? Um, Google's been out with Google Glasses and trying to figure out how do they continue to evolve that product. So I think the if I look at the valuations and I look at, um, okay. it's a really early warning indi indicator that says there's something real there. But the applications are just limited to the imagination. I actually think it's got a tremendous, tremendous future. On the other hand, when Facebook finally said what the Oculus was going to do the other day, it was pretty much all games. So the first 
you know, stage of virtual reality is going to be gaming. And then they'll make some money that way, and then pretty soon we'll all be no longer flying to Europe. We'll just be feeling like we're walking down the street. And we probably, I would say in 10 years, you probably will, with some device, be able to be so convinced that you're walking down the streets of Paris that you'll really have to debate whether you need to go there. My, that's my opinion. But we'll still go there sometimes. Okay, we'll go here and then there. <laughs> and then to the back over there. Might be a better experience to make sure it never rains. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, the sun's always shining. Yeah. Paul Lemming from Jacksonville, Florida. Um, we've talked a lot about secure, um, privacy. Could you talk some about security? Good. Um, as we go from billions to maybe trillions of connected devices, does, does the sheer number of devices maybe swamp the security issues and make it less of a problem? Or does it make it much more of a problem, issue one? And two, could you talk a little bit about what role Flextronics can play in maybe making the Internet of Things more secure? Could I just say that's a very intelligent way of asking the question? And the idea that it could swamp them is a very creative and interesting yeah. point. Yeah. So, so, you know, you're right. Some of the data, they, you know, they talk about it, you know, that the amount of connected devices will increase 5x from today um, just by 2020. And it's a huge growth rate. So you got this huge influence coming in. And I would also add to that that it's not only just the connected devices of the kind of things that we're used to, but all kinds of companies are creating new, they are creating new <laughs> innovations. And some of these connected devices are coming out of China. They're coming out of uh, India. They're coming out of all these different places. And it creates, it does, um, security is a huge consideration then as a result. So I don't, I don't believe sheer volume actually helps that problem. I think it creates more challenges. Um, as more and more things are connected into that internet, um, it's an access point that could be at risk from a security standpoint. So every single access point is a potential entry point for risk. So you're mm -hmm. basically going to 50 billion new potentially risky access points. Mm -hmm. Great. Simultaneously, remember, we're, we're dealing with faster product life cycles, more international competition, more companies like Baidu and Alibaba who are, will be getting into hardware products just for the same reason we already talked about all of which are rushing in with solutions, and every one of them is going to be connected. So you have a, yeah. it's a huge challenge, and uh, volume isn't, isn't going to solve it. And, you know, our things, you know, that, that so it's a big issue. And, and I would say from a board of director standpoint, I'm on multiple boards and talk to a lot of guys there on a lot of boards, it's probably the number one issue at the director level um, table today is how do they deal with security? And people have always talked about security as being in their data centers. And they've always thought about the, what are the solutions in the data centers. And now with all these end connected nodes, it's, it's a vehicle into those data centers that, that we now also have to solve. And, and you know, your second party question is, is there something Flextronics can do about it? You know, security starts um, at the silicon level. So when there's an end device, there's some kind of <laughs> silicon drive in it. So, and that access to point is the vulnerable point. And you have to build middleware that interfaces with the, the functionality of the device, what is it actually trying to do, the actual unique software for that product, all the way into interfacing with that chip. And we have to work to build these middle layer um, systems um, to make sure that it's more and more secure. But um, I don't think there's, a, there's an answer. I mean, there's a huge awareness about it today. Um, you can see the valuation of, of the, uh, any company that's trying to solve that problem. Guys like FireEye and Palo Alto Networks have huge valuations. Um, so it shows you the importance of these kind of companies and in, in the, in, in the role today. And, um, you know, I don't think it's solved. I think it's, uh, it continues to be a risk, and, and everybody's really aware of it, and people are uh, working hard to solve it. I don't know if anybody saw the piece. I think it was in the New York Times this week about this guy who's a... A, sci a novelist, but who's becoming a huge advisor to the Pentagon, who really believes we could be headed toward, you know, hot war with China, and that if we did, uh, they would be able to potentially blow our F-15s out of the sky by invoking software they've built into chips that we have embedded into our air airplanes that we got out of China. I mean, it, it's a pretty apocalyptic scenario, but the fact is there are a lot of components that have been coming from strange places that have been going into all kinds of systems, and who knows what's in them. I mean, so security with the Internet of Things is a big, big challenge. Big, now, big challenge. I promised yep. a few people I'd call on them, and there's a lot of hands now. Who did I promise I'd call? Okay, I didn't know if I... Okay, we'll <laughs> get him. But the mic's there, and then we'll go to you. 
We have five more minutes, but we'll try to get as many people in as we can. Yeah, I don't know if you want to, Richard Pascal, uh, San Francisco, you may or may not want to comment on this, but you, you sort of sit in the air traffic control tower looking over this set of activities that you've been talking about, and I would think you would be the private equity in, uh, Goldman Sachs best friend uh, for the point of view that you have of what's, what the action is, and I'm wondering business model-wise for you as you think about the evolution of what you're doing, whether you see it beginning and ending as you've defined it today or whether you could see it going beyond where it is today. What a good question for Flextronics, wow. You know, as part of private equity and the, and the interactions between our two companies? Is it's just the knowledge question? that you have, I think he's suggesting. You have an interesting position in the ecosystem. Yeah. So, uh, so the answer is, um, yeah, we're, we are an unbelievable wealth, wealth of information, and we should be private equity's best friend, quite frankly. And some companies um, use us strategically, and many don't really understand how much we really see. And um, you know, there's more to it. You know, we talk about innovation. Everything we've talked about today is this intelligence of things and the products. There's also an intelligence of things there, of, in the supply chain. So we, we not only innovate with our customers from a product standpoint, but we innovate across the whole supply chain. And if you think about what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean by that is we're moving our entire company to real-time data, just like a connected product device in the field, so that we can capture data points of what's going on in the marketplace. Where are inventory levels? What are the transportation systems? What are the hubs that we're using? How is demand shifting? And how are we redistributing that inventory around the world. So part of our innovation is built around enabling commerce to, to kind of grease um, the skid, so to speak, so it runs more fluidly, especially if you have more and more products that are built in more and more locations as a result of more and more middle classes coming up everywhere in the world, you have a more distributed supply chain. So you chain. have that visibility across a huge range of industries. Yeah. Across industries. So what we, yeah. we can do is we can, we can triangulate within industry and then we triangulate across industries. Mm. Because a lot of what we see in consumer products because of their fast product life cycles, the innovations in that supply chain we believe will carry across to medical and automotive in the future. So we're actually using the embedded knowledge that we have of the consumer industry and triangulating how, the, how can we enable the supply chain of automotive and medical guys in the future when they have to step up into more international competition. So it gives us a great lens in. Private equity is a great place for to come to. We're a great place for someone like a private equity to come into and build very strategic relationships with. Um, and you know, almost every private equity company that would be getting ready to buy another company, we're probably building something for them. So we actually already know the company very often. But, but also moving towards this real-time management of the supply chain where our supply chain itself is intelligent and connected and mobile and, in, and take, taking data points out of the field is also a very interesting position for us to create value to guys like private equity. Oh, that's fascinating. Okay, back there, we've got the mic right behind you, and I think this will have to be the last question. Thank you. I'm uh, Michael Conniff from the Isaacson School for New Media here in Aspen. And uh, you remember back in the late 90s, there was a lot of talk about so-and-so gets the internet or doesn't get the internet. Um, I get the internet. I don't get the things. Um, I get the home stuff. I get the stuff on your body. But can you just spend a little time talking about like what's, what's already out there in terms of how, I guess it would be devices connected to the internet. Um, because you've done a great job on the consumer side, but on the, on the business side, I, I feel kind of still in the dark. Thank you. Well, look, let's take, so here's why I think the internet um, of things or the intelligent things will be such a powerful force. And the reason is, you know, independent of consumer or, um, you know, consumer and privacy issues and security issues of which we'll have to go solve, it actually is gonna solve real problems. I'll give you, I'll give you some simple data. Think about like a connected car. So you think about a connected car. So the data, McKinsey put out some data that said that by 2025, we'll be able to save anywhere between like 200 billion all the way up to $2 trillion as a result of improvements with connected cars, which is just think about it. It's if they can like talk to one another and not- Because of reduced accidents. Reduced accidents. Kinds of things, yeah. At the same time, you have over 100,000 people a year that are Fatalities. I mean, what is the cost of that? Does it include the cost of that? And then you think about interfacing into, you know, you guys all love probably uh, Waze, you know, or Google, where it, where it lists the Google traffic, Maps, yeah. you know, how heavy the traffic is and all that. 
Think about real-time rerouting um, these cars using traffic signals and other things that are connected. So now you have the car connected, you have the car, the car to car connectivity. You can always take it to the next level, which is autonomous vehicle, which you know I sit in traffic an hour and a half every day. It's like an unbelievably um, decrease in productivity. So I actually think you're solving real problems. And that's, that's a great case of, of how in the automobile we'll take it to the next level. But again, it's, it's a big ecosystem. It's the cars talking to each other. It's the interface into the cars. It's the cars talking to the traffic lights. It's the cars talking to the Verizon network that's enabling everything to be connected. It's a system. The world today competes on a system. To provide the optimized consumer experience, you have to compete with the system. It's hardware, software content. <laughs> And it's with that hardware having connected nodes into the end environment so it can respond real time to real environmental data, data and adapt immediately without waiting for a user to, to influence it. But, That's the way the world's going. But I just want to say one, I know we got to end, but one key thing that we should have said earlier probably is, I should have said at least, you know, there's already software in the street lights and the cars and the Fitbit and you know, lighting systems in a lot of places and increasingly those things are connected. What we have not got yet is the intelligence, to the software to really draw that information all together and create useful knowledge out of it. I mean, a lot of the things that you just described make a lot of sense in theory, but one of the huge challenges that society faces going forward is writing the software and making it secure and giving the privacy features that will allow us to take advantage of the information that's being thrown off by all this connected stuff and really make it into a system. And that is really at the earliest stages. But that's why companies like GE and Cisco and Microsoft and others are so excited about how much money they can and make. And I'm, I'm in the middle of it with, in Silicon Valley. I'm based in Silicon Valley. And the, the most money, the hottest startups, are all built around data analytics. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's tied closely in many cases to the Internet of Things. I want to just make one final point because we got to wrap, but I'm moderating a session at 1020 with Fred Krupp of the Environmental Defense Fund in Door Hosier, and one of his central points is that sensors, which are part of the Internet of Things, could become the catalytic function of the new environmental movement because all of us are going to be able to measure pollution everywhere we go, and he thinks that is a massive revolution, and it's totally connected to the Internet of Things. So this discussion goes on, and thank you all for being here.